is Kelly. Um, welcome to my our channel. I'm starting it with my best friend A, who does live on the other side of the country, so it would be kind of hard for us to do videos where we're sitting in the same room. Um, so we're doing the we're taking inspiration from the Blog Brothers and going to be doing video responses to each other, very loose responses <laughs> to each other's videos. Um, and I'm going to be kicking off the channel by talking about. How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water by Angie Cruz. Um, and basically about what I love about this, sh this book. I was going to say show. About what I love about this book and the characters and relationships that stood out to me. So quick summary of the book. Um, this book is about a Dominican woman who immigrates to the U.S. Um, who was working at a factory for a really long time. But then that factory shut down. So she had to get unemployment benefits. Um, however, comma. In order to keep getting those benefits, she needs to show that she's like actively looking for a job. And so she has to go to the social worker and do a series of interviews that the social worker is then going to collect this information from the interviews and then help her find employment. Um, however, Gata, our main character, really uses these interviews more as therapy sessions loosely because it's not like the social worker is coming back with any kind of, of advice or anything. This is really just Gata speaking. Um, and I think craft-wise, Angie Cruz really shows a deep understanding of her characters and just why the story need to be, needed to be told in a series of interviews. And I think it's because Gata very much, we see that she just doesn't talk to people. She doesn't let people know really what's going on with her. Um, again, because she's just, She's the oldest daughter. She's taking care of everyone. She can't let herself be not okay for the people in her life. Um, but this space where she's just speaking to someone and just letting everything loose, um, it's just not a kind of situation she would be in if not for this this interview, these sessions. And so I think that's why really we are able to get all the story. Um, and I think more importantly, they're her words. We see her wins and her faults and all of that jazz through her own words. Uh, and I think it just gives her agency over her own story, which is just really wonderful to see. Um, there is gonna be spoilers in this video. I'm not gonna go over every single detail of the book because that would be a really long video. Um, I really, really enjoyed this book, but I'm just gonna focus on the relationships that stood out to me um, because of my personal experience and how I related to them. I'm going to be focusing on Gara and her son, Fernando, and then Lulu and her son, Andones, and then Gara and her sister, Angela. Um, and those those are really the relationships that I'm going to delve into. Again, I'm not going to break everything bit by beat, but uh, still contain spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, this would be the time to dip. Um, yeah. How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water covers such heavy topics with such nuance you know, um, domestic violence, homophobia, gentrification, machismo, like there's just so much covered in this book. Um, and I just think Angie Cruz does a really good job of showing the nuances of these situations for the Latina community and for, and for people in the Latina community. Um, and it's just really refreshing to see these nuanced takes um, and have people within our own community tell these stories. Um, and there's just such amazing lines. We, for example, uh, in talking about the exploitation of immigrant workers, we have this line, I see this country is like the fisherman with fast hands on the beach who shows you the big, fi the big fat fish, but when he cooks it, it shrinks, which just, I mean, the imagery of that is beautiful. Um, we understand the impacts of the abuse that Gara suffered on her and her sister. Uh, I think another beautiful line that talks about machismo um, and again encompasses such a nuanced take is when the women try to teach a man a lesson, here come the mothers and the sisters to save them. I mean, what a line. But again, it's nuanced, right? Because Angela takes care of her brother after he does what he does and he's an awful person but again she talks about like this is my brother so it's not this black and white thing and you're not immediately thinking that God is a bad person for helping out her brother but you also understand 
where the wife is coming from and again it's just nuance and you see these characters as well-rounded characters and their actions are not inherently good or bad they're just the actions that are born out of their situation their trauma their experiences their point of view and again it's just refreshing to see these nuanced takes and these nuanced characters and these role rounded characters in the latina community where we've had so much of it lacking in the past um, but again, I, I want to focus on certain relationships that stood out to me. Um, me being a, a first gen immigrant daughter, oldest immigrant daughter, I can definitely relate and saw a lot of my life experiences and the relationship between Cara and Fernando. Through the way that Cara and Luna take care of their boys, we see the effects of machismo and homophobia and how that affects how they raise them for better or for worse, right? Like this, Gara pushing the part of Fernando away that is even a little bit queer is very much a reflection, a, a response to her being afraid for him, right? She's afraid of his differentness. He's afraid of his otherness because he's already othered by being a man of color, by being a Dominican man like he's already othered in that way and so to be othered even more it scares her she's afraid for him she wants just what's best for him and we get that we get that take from her we understand that when Kara sees a poster that says being different is a gift and her response is to say no it means more suffering like we're not gonna sit here and say that it's it's easy to be a queer man of color or it's easy to be queer in the latina community or as a person of color because it's not it comes with its challenges but i think we understand that it's more harmful to suppress yourself and to make yourself miserable by not being who you are than it is to try to walk this world being who you are so we understand Fernando, we understand Cara. Again, the nuances of these relationships. Cara is not inherently a bad person because she wants to push this part away of himself. We understand where she's coming from. But we also understand how Fernando got to the point where he put a restraining order on her. Like, it's not a great thing to have to put a restraining order on your mother. But again, as, a, as an older immigrant daughter, I get how we got to that point. I get how suffocating our parents can be, their expectations, their, their fears, their trauma, and how it swallows us and it becomes us until we cannot tell who we are on our own. And the only way to do that is to step away. And when she continues to want to swallow him into herself, he puts a restraining on her on her and again it's not a great thing to have to do to one of your parents but we understand where he's coming from and when we understand where god is coming from i think another really important line to come out of this book is the american children get more traumatized more easy than us um because isn't that a thing we hear from the older generation all the time that we're too sensitive that we we overreact that we really have nothing to be traumatized over or depressed or anxious like they don't understand when we're depressed and anxious when like they had to walk 30 miles <laughs> to school and cross a river and cross the mountains and i think they don't understand that we understand that they're also traumatized they're also so traumatized and they have so much to unpack and they're carrying so much weight of their past but they refuse to acknowledge that it's trauma and they refuse to acknowledge that they need help and so when we're doing it they're like i don't i don't understand like if i'm fine why aren't you fine but it's not that we get more traumatized or easily traumatized compared to them it's that we're facing our trauma and we're trying our best to break those generational cycles that continue to perpetrate certain things in our community in our lives so that we can do better because was that not the point was the point not for us to get here and to do better to get better to be more than what we were uh to be able to be ourselves to the fullest gara is traumatized she is i mean we see it in the scene where fernando um, I think it's the scene where he is leaving in some tight pants and she's like, no, you're not leaving this house. And he like stands up and like, you know, starts to 
be like, no, I'm leaving the house however I want to be. And it's not like he's going to hit her, but she most, well, at least I don't know. That's not, we don't get that part of the story because, again, it's all through her words. But we do know that she tells us that she flinched back, right? She flinched back. She was like, oh, no, he's bigger than I am. And so she went, ooh, because she's traumatized, because she was in an abusive relationship. And, again, it's not that... Fernando's more traumatized than she is because you cannot equate trauma like that. It's that he is facing the consequences of her actions and of his childhood and all these things while she is not. Uh, and I think, again, it's just really nice to see a new one's take where neither person in this relationship is bad or evil or any of that. It's just that they're both reacting to their environment and to what they grew up believing and they're doing the best they can with the tools that they have which isn't a lot of tools especially on Kata's part it's not like she's going to therapy it's not like she understands what gentrification is and how it affects it's not like she understands the concepts of intersectionality and all these other stuff or why homophobia is bad because she was never taught that and for none like Again, nuanced, and I just, I love that. I appreciate that from the book so much. Um, the other relationship that really stood out to me was Lulu and her son, Andones. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the Netflix K-drama, It's Okay to Not Be Okay, but it's it's also about trauma. Um, <laughs> a little, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, um... Yeah, it's also about trauma. It's about trauma and things, and I'm not going to get into that. Um, I could talk about it if you guys want me to talk about it, because I love, love that series. But essentially, it's about, well, one of the main characters is a writer. She's a fairy tale writer. And there's a story in there that reminds me so much of Lulu and her relationship with Andones. It's called The Monkfish. And essentially, this woman gives birth to this baby girl and she feeds her everything that she wants she carries her everywhere she wants to go like this girl never has to lift a hand to do anything for herself and then when the mom starts to get tired essentially getting older and she can no longer provide everything for the daughter she asks her daughter hey can you like help me out and the girl responds with dude i don't have any arms you never let me use my arms so they went away and then, you know, when the mom's like, I'm tired, can you carry me instead? She's like, I don't have any legs. You never let me walk on my own, so I don't have any legs. And, you know, at the end, the mom ends up shouting to her in anger. Um, and she says, you weren't my perfect baby at all. You're like a useless monk fish. All you do is eat what I feed you. You can't do anything on your own. You're an utter failure. And then she throws the baby into the sea and it ends with like fishermen being able to hear this baby like call out to mom like please come back like I don't understand why I did wrong or something like that. Um, and that's what that's what Lulu and Andones relationship reminds me of and it reminds me of those it, like it reminds me of these relationships that moms have with their kids with their boys specifically, where they do everything for them. You know, they wash their clothes, they do the dishes for the entire time that they live with them. So then these men who never really learn to take care of them go out into the world and expect everyone else to take care of them because they never learned how to do it for themselves. And we see how that backfires in Andones and Lulu because Andones, you know, gets married, has kids, turns out, he doesn't know how to take care of himself, so he's not going to know how to take care of a wife and kids. Lulu ends up having to take them in, and she's now charged with taking care of his kids and helping out his wife when that was supposed to be his responsibility. And while, yes, Andones sucks because he should take charge of that situation, you understand how he got to that point. Because, like, in the story, Lulu was a mother that did everything for him. There's actually a line where Gata says... Um, Lulu would hold the back of his neck tight like she was driving him. Therefore, he never learned how to do anything for himself. And so the consequences of machismo in this case are that, that she ends up having at her old age when she was ready to just kind of chill and have fun with Kara and listen to their radio, can no longer do that because now she's charged for taking care of these kids that her son should be taking care of. Um, and, you know, again... 
the relationship there, the results of these relationships are the consequences of their life experiences and social expectations and the way that machismo operates in Latina culture. It's a, it's a result of the deeply ingrained machismo in our community. And I see it constantly with with people in my life and in the latina community actively happening in real time and i'm just so glad that this book is able to explore the different layers and the different relationships and how this affects the relationships because you have cara and fernando you know he very much chose to go off on his own and like essentially make himself something away from his mom but it could not have gone that way right like he chose to do that another way he could have ended up was like andones where he just kind of like let's gotta do everything for him and again both of these relationships are born from the same thing of machismo and the way that our community thinks about the way that we raise boys and the way that men are supposed to act because gotta push his friend on the way for him being queer and essentially not fitting those traditional masculine standards that she expects of him. And then Lulu coddles her son because of machismo and he ends up not being able to be his own person. He's a monkfish, essentially. Um, and yeah, those relationships really stood out to me. I thought they were beautifully portrayed. Um, again, they're, they're written with nuance. You understand where every character is coming from. And I think that's just what's really important. And it's written with like love like you know because the author is actually you know part of the latina community so she understands the nuances and it's just really refreshing to see um and the the last relationship that really stood out to me was cara's relationship with angela which explores this idea of being the oldest immigrant daughter and having to take care of your younger siblings as someone who had to do that, who had to be a parental figure for your younger siblings, it really messes up the relationship that you're supposed to have with them. And you see that with Cara and Angela because they're like always at each other's throats because, you know, Angela's like, you're like not my mom, essentially. And again, I used to get that from my brothers all the time. You're not my mom, but like mom isn't here. So I am your mom. And it makes the dynamic of the relationship really strained because you need each other to survive, but you're also kind of angry at each other for things that are outside of your control. And I think just like the way we see the sisters interact reminds me a lot of the relationship between Fleabag and her sister, where they're both kind of talking at each other and they're both dealing with the trauma. For those of you who haven't seen Fleabag, spoiler, but their mom died. You know, why? Well, I, mean, I don't know if it's a spoiler because you know it at the beginning. I don't know, but their mom is dead. And they're both dealing with that death in very different ways, but they're not reaching to each other. So they both think that the other is fine and the other one is doing better than the other one. And I feel like God and Angela are very much in that same boat where they were both traumatized by their childhood in very different ways. Because again, no one child has the same parent. Um, and that lives in the same kind of household because experiences are unique to that relationship with the parent. But Gara and Angela were both traumatized, but they're both dealing it, with it in very different ways. And they're refusing to talk to each other. But that's why I think that the confrontation that they have at the end or near the end is like beautiful. It's gorgeous. You know, we see Angela be like, dude, you need to learn to love a different way because you're loving us the way that our mother did. And that worked out for no one. And Kara is finally able to admit that, like, <clears throat> she's been going through things and that she's sad. And you see them both finally talk to each other. And it's just so nice to see. Uh, I really like where we end up with, how we end up with Kara at the end of the book. That imagery of her sitting on the train tracks and letting Fernando's stroller run, like, get away from her a little bit because she's falling asleep. I thought that quote, the... Yes, I was a good mother to Fernando, but I cannot, but I can now see. I was also this mother in the dream, young, afraid, alone, falling asleep near the tracks of the train. Beautiful imagery because again, the nuances of the situation. Yeah, <laughs> some of the things that she did to Fernando growing up 
really traumatized him and made him want to push her away. But again, we understand it. It's because she was young, she was afraid, and she was alone. And many of our immigrant mothers are alone. They were young and they're afraid and they're alone because even when they're in relationships, because of the way that machismo operates, they are still single mothers. And, I, and it's just nice to see her come to that understanding and it gives me hope as a reader that she's gonna mend that relationship with her sons and with her sisters and really start to break those generational trauma chains. Uh, like the fact that Fernando ends up leaving her food at the end and it shows that they, they're, they're about to start bridging that relationship is just amazing to see and I, I, it makes me so happy. Um, yeah. And the last part that I want to go over is what the title means to me and what I take away from How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, uh, which Angela actually says to Kara. She says, when Kara is freaking out and being really upset because Fernando left, you know, Angela replies with, you're drowning in a glass of water. And what an image and what a line. Um... And I just think it's very reminiscent, again, of how we approach trauma in the Latina community. Like, it's very much just get over it or it's not that deep. Um, you're drowning in a glass of water. But Angela lost her son. And we get where Angela, where, uh, not Angela, Gada lost her son. Angela understands why Fernando left, right? Because we get later in that conversation that Fernando left because of all the things and Angela was very much privy to that and she spoke with Fernando and even consistently asked Fernando to give Cara a chance and to really uh essentially like understand where she's coming from uh but so when Cara is crying over Fernando leaving Angela's like well you kind of made your own bed you're drowning in a glass of water like this is kind of your fault and also just like what did you expect but Again, it's just such a strong imagery because I think it's very reminiscent of things that we see in the community in our community on a daily and, a, and like going back to that like concept of like we get more traumatized, we get easily more traumatized than like they did here in the states, and we have depression and anxiety and all these other things. And how dare we have mental illness when you know we have it better than they do? Um, so I think that concept of drowning in a glass of water is just very prominent to the mental health discussions and trauma discussions that we have in our community. Um, I don't know, and it also remind me, reminded me of that stat, which is essentially, which was like, most drownings actually happen in shallow water. Um, and I'm sure there's something there with that, because you know, a glass of water is essentially shallow. Well, depending on how how long, how big the glass of water is. Um, I don't know. I think sometimes water appears to be shallow uh, and you're told to just stand up, but it's actually deeper, significantly deeper than they can see. And it's harder to swim than you would think. Um, yeah. And... I think the idea that Kara, despite everything she's gone through, is drowning in a glass of water is very reminiscent. Uh, is, and then I think despite everything, Kara is not drowning in a glass of water. But yes, I really love this book because it's it's a nuanced take on on a lot of things. It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful book that encompasses a lot of things. Um, and I think that uh, everyone should read it. It's also short. It's also really short. It's a really, she's a thin book. She's a thin book. Um, but I definitely recommend it. Um, so tune in next time. And A will be coming to talk about whatever she wants to talk about. Um, yeah.